What's going on guys? It's the Ancient Greek here, and today we're going to be talking about the early history of Macedon before Philip II and Alexander the Great. So, Macedon would have started out at around 700 BC, which is just a few hundred years after the Bronze Age collapse. At this time, Greece was just starting to come out of a Dark Age into the Archaic period. And much information about the period of their very foundation is unknown, except for information that we get from the t time when they were not in the Archaic period, but they were in the Classical period, which is much later. So the only real credible information that we have on Macedon is information that the Macedonians gave us from the Classical period. So, because of this, it's going to be a little bit sketchy to be diving into this period, but without further ado, let's get into it. So, Really, the expansion of the Macedonian Kingdom, if we want to look at this from a military perspective, has been described as a three-stage process. And that's a quote straight from Wikipedia, but bear with me here. So, it really is a three-stage process. It starts, and it's a lot like Rome, because Rome did the same sort of thing where Rome started out being a small community, and Rome was even a single city. And it ended up venturing out to conquer all these other territories. Now, the traditional capital of Macedon, which was founded by Argeus, the head of the Argeid dynasty, he was a... Actually, he's mentioned in the Iliad as a hero of the Trojan War and from Argos, which is, by the way, all the way down here. You, this is Argos, but you can't see it here. I'll have to pull up the strategic overview. So you can at least see it better here. So, Argolis is right down here. And... And uh, the city is kind of wedged into this armpit of the Peloponnese. This is the Peloponnese, this entire island right here. And this hero ventured north from Argos all the way up into Macedonia. And there's a story where it's kind of like the Macedonian-Dorian exchange, where the Dorians went south and the future Macedonians the Argeids went north and they created Macedonia and the Dorians, you know, created all their states, most notably Sparta. So here he is going up north fighting various battles, maybe and we're not actually, we don't have any concrete evidence on that, but he eventually ends up founding the city of Agai which is named after him. And this city is basically the beginning of the Kingdom of Macedon, and it becomes kind of the core of the kingdom to start off with. So, much like Rome, the founding of Macedon is shrouded in mythical origin. Okay, we know the story of Rome with Romulus and Remus, and how... Romulus uh, builds his version of the city and the city walls, and Remus mocks him by jumping over the wall, and then Romulus kills him, and that's why the city is named after Romulus, Rome. And that is where the story of Rome kicks off, and this kicks off in much the same way. So, Argeid the Argeids, Argeus or Aegis, he comes up and he founds the city of Agai, named after him. And 
he pretty much starts the Macedonian Kingdom. Now, the Macedonian Kingdom starts off being no better than any of the other tribes inhabiting this area, and that is the next point that we're going to jump to, so the tribes that are inhabiting the area. So, at the time, the area of Macedonia, right here in purple, would be inhabited by various Illyrian tribes, maybe some Gaelic tribes in the north, although the Gaelic, the Gauls didn't migrate here until later, so probably not. And there's some, you know, just tribes that have always been here since before uh, he, like the Pannonian tribes and the Thracians, since before, the Thracians are a big one, since before Argeus uh, made his way up here. So, they are in this situation where they need to get rid of all these tribes and expand the Kingdom of Macedon out to the boundaries that are actually shown on this map, which isn't going to happen for a while. I mean, at first it's going to be just this, and then it's eventually going to be over here in the Chalkidiki Peninsula, but the Chalkidiki Peninsula won't always be with Macedon, and that we'll get into later. So... Macedon starts here, with the capital here at Aigai, and they start fighting against all these tribes, mostly Illyrians and Thracians, and later, much later, they would turn against the states of southern and central Greece. We're talking about Thessaly first, and not really Epirus. Epirus has always been a friend of Macedon. And then, you know, Athens and Sparta and all that under Philip V. So... Ah, Philip II. So, uh, that is how Macedon really starts its journey, again, much like Rome. And in order to do that, they had to very quickly develop an economic system that would favor them and that would be very flexible, and the Macedonians had to have a very strategic and tactical mind in that kind of a way. So, let's go back into here and take a look at their terrain. So you can see they have highlands, and they have lowlands. And upper Macedonia appears mostly highlands. Lower Macedonia is very, very low, right next to sea level, as it gets closer to the sea. So, there would be two general economic subdivisions of Macedon. That would be Upper Macedonia in the highlands, and Lower Macedonia in this region over here. And really, the highlands would also be up over here as well. So this entire kind of a crescent-shaped highland area going on with a valley in between, that would also be considered the lowlands. But actually, this valley would be used by the upper Macedonians. So let's just say lower Macedonia is this area playing right here. So the way... The Upper Macedonians would live is they would live a very pastoral life, and actually all Macedonians would live a pastoral life. But these guys would live a transhumans pastoral life, which is where, according to the seasons, they would change the place where they took their herds to graze and grow and raise them. And that would be herds of, you know, cow, uh, sheep goats, you know, all those, all that good stuff, all those great animals. So, it's animal husbandry, essentially. Picking out the best animals to be grown, who are the best suited to survive and provide the most amount of food. And, in the summer, they would spend their days up in the highlands over here, and in the winter, they would come down to the lowlands. And this is an alternating, so again, that strategic mindset. All of that starts off at the very beginning with the way that they live. And this, I don't know what they're trying to show me here. That must be like a burial mound of some sort with some kind of significance. 
But anyway, I thought that was a logger's camp, and I was going to bring that into my explanation, but it's not. So here's the other thing, natural resources. Now, the Macedonians, they started off with the whole pastoral living, but pastoral living only gets you so far as far as wealth goes. And you can't really make coins from pastoral living. You need minerals, you need resources that come from mining in the mountains. And so that's what they started doing. They started taking advantage of all this mountainous terrain, and they started mining out minerals and resources, and that helped them take off their coin production around 500 BC. They started taking off their coin production. And really the first major political historical figure would appear around 500 BC when uh, the Persian invasion happened. Xerxes, you know. Thermopylae and everything. That's what's happening down south. But in the meantime, Macedon is completely occupied and taken over by the Persian Empire. And they are in the Persian Empire, a part of the Persian Empire. And Alexander I is the king is the king of Macedon. So at this point, Macedon has fought off those Illyrian and Thracian tribes we were talking about earlier. And they have established cities such as Dion and Arnesia to grow their kingdom and make it bigger. And actually, Arnesia probably wasn't established by them until later. But they usually say something about it here. Yeah, believed to have originally built by the Illyrian Tolanti tribe. So... It was built by the Illyrians, but later taken by the Macedonians. And this one, Dion, is named for Zeus. And that starts another thing that I'm going to get into right after the economy bit. So, it's sacred because of the worship of Zeus. So, they would have built places like Dion and expanded their infrastructure and built all these villages everywhere and just expanded their territorial control and solidified their core. But under the and when they got taken over by the Persian Empire, they were largely allowed to continue on as a kingdom under the same king, Alexander the First. They just had to basically support the Persian Empire and probably pay tribute to them, which they did. But Alexander warned the rest of Greece that Persia was planning an invasion of the rest of Greece. And they came down to the camp of Greek soldiers that was preparing to defend the border. And Alexander I uh, snuck into the Greek camp under the cover of night and revealed the plans of the Persian invasion to all of the Greeks who were preparing to defend and he revealed exactly their movement and where they were going to go and where they were planning on striking and that way the Greeks knew how to set up and plan their defense so had it not been for Alexander the first they wouldn't have known and it would have made him a lot harder for them to win and maybe impossible for them to win and that would have changed history entirely so thanks to Alexander the first for saving the Greek world. Huge applaud for him. But, so getting back into the economy and minerals, resources, all allowed to the Macedonians in the lower Macedonian region to become more and more wealthy. And the culture of the Macedonian people was very much founded upon their economic style. So again, that transhuman style. So Macedonian men were encouraged to learn how to hunt because it was a central part of their culture and encouraged to learn combat. And that is perhaps the reason why Macedonians were so effective 
as a fighting force. Now, as far as Macedonian military organization goes in the early days, I'm going to get into that right after I highlight this key point. So, Macedon is essentially worshipping Greek gods. So the same exact gods that are worshipped in southern Greece, you know, Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, and Apollo, Artemis, Hera, and all those other great gods are the same ones that are being worshipped in Macedon. And the most important god for the Macedonians is Zeus, by far. And Zeus is actually so important that he is idolized and he is kind of followed as a role model for the Macedonian state and he is sacred to the Macedonians and he appears as a result on much of their coinage and Dion was actually built for Zeus as a place for Zeus and sacred to the Macedonians in that way so the Macedonians solidify their power their culture as being a, a pastoralist culture and also taking advantage of the rich mineral and forest, that is wood resources, that they have available in the land of Macedonia. And Macedon did do a little bit of agriculture as far as like horticulture with plants, you know, growing crops, but they, that was only a supplement to the pastoralism, so really it was all focused on animal husbandry, mostly, and that really solidified their strength, too, because, and their, their keen eye, their ability to spot advantages in the environment, that would have been greatly developed by that sort of lifestyle. So, like the Romans, they started out very militarily. They started out having little choice but to go that route. And they ended up being very successful at it, and they ended up solidifying their core despite falling under the heel of the Persian Empire. And the thing is, they didn't fall that much under the heel of the Persian Empire. And that and with, on that note, I will go straight into their military organization in the early days. So, in the early times, their military organization would have been pretty much like the rest of southern Greece, except for a Macedonian twist. And that Macedonian twist is what I'm going to be focusing on. So, Macedonians developed a sacred cavalry tradition sacred. I use the word sacred. I guess it is sacred. I mean, it definitely played a key role in the future. And that cavalry tradition is based off of the companions, or the hetairoi, which was a council that served as basically advisors to the autocratic king. So Macedon was ruled by an autocratic king with the Hatairoi as advisors, and everything else as far as military commanders and any other government, local position, whatever like that, governors of local cities or whatever, was, was uh, created at the whim of the monarch. So... If we take Alexander I as the monarch, any governor of any city, any treasurer, any strategos that is commander of any army in any certain area of the kingdom was appointed by Alexander I at the whim of Alexander I. But the Hittite boy would advise him, and they would be kind of his personal bodyguard, advising him on military matters and possibly even financial matters as well. 
So, the cavalry of Macadon, as we go back into this panel, was was very, very effective and very powerful. And it was the Hippias, as it is called in the rest of Greece. Hippias usually indicates very heavy cavalry, very heavy melee cavalry, most often used as shock cavalry to break a phalanx line. Now, the phalanx would consist of hoplites that are much the same as the rest of the Greek hoplites. Not that much different. And uh, they would have had their own Macedonian cultural insignias on the shields and everything. Probably that octopus isn't the most accurate thing, but really, shields in ancient Greece were personalized, and the only shields in Greece that were standardized were Spartan shields. And Spartan uniforms were standardized to be red, like the red tunics were standardized to be red, but Macedonian uniforms were not standardized yet. They varied, but they probably would have stuck just due to nationalism close to the colors of their city-state, which would have been, you know, the purple background and the and the uh, Hellenistic pan-Hellenic sun. I mean the Pan-Hellenic Sun, not Hellenistic. Or the Virginia Sun, that is the other name for it. So, but the thing is, purple was actually a very, very expensive color. It was one of the most expensive dyes to come by, so I doubt they would have used purple. They could have used maybe blue, or maybe some other cheap color, like white, which is like the cheapest or they could, some of them could have used red, it really just varied. That gets into the whole, like, dyes in ancient Greek militaries topic that I'm not going to dive too deep into. So, that is basically what the Macedonian army would be. Greek phalanx supported by the Hippias, and also some slingers, which would have been derived from the hunting culture of the pastoralists and Upper Macedonia, because they know rough terrain and hunting strategy, and they know how to wield a bow or slings very well, or, and even javelins very well. But the Macedonian army would mostly utilize slingers and javelin men, and they wouldn't really utilize archers a lot at all. Mostly at least when I see a Macedonian army, I see them using uh, slingers, primarily supported by javelins. Javelin men. But not too many archers. So, it's just a basic phalanx line with your slingers out front, your cavalry on the sides, and that line would become more complex with the rise of Philip II in the future. So, that is how Macedon would develop, and it would develop in very much the same way as Rome did. And the terrain that Macedon started out in gave it a very, very good advantage, because the reality of Greece as a whole is that Greece was not a very fertile place to have a civilization in. I mean, Greece in its entirety is very rocky, so like all of this is rocky, all this is mountains. You can see it pretty well down here. So you see the mountains, it's just endless. It's all rocky, it's all mountains, there's not a lot of place to plant crops or anything, there's not a lot of places to grow, and Greeks had to be very innovative as a result coming out of the Bronze Age. But, and that's why these civilizations ended up being so great. And the thing is, Macedon had an advantage because of the abundance of natural resources and the ability to 
uh, have such a big swath of land and such a flexible system where you could go from the valleys to the highlands and there was so much abundance of forests and animals and animal husbandry and hunting just wasn't a problem. Mineral resources weren't a problem at all. And down in the south, it was much more tight. The territory was much smaller in size. So Athens, for example, Attica, it's just this piece of land right here, whereas Macedon is all of this. <clears throat> and even further up north over here, this segment as well. So as long as they could defeat the tribes, which they were forced to do and they became very good at as they advanced militarily along the Greek spectrum, utilizing Greek-style armies and Greek-style tactics mixed with Macedonian tactics to make the army more flexible even in the early days. But even so, at the beginning of the kingdom, battles would often be not standardized as in every kingdom. They would often most be mostly be tribal conflicts and skirmishers, skirmishes where two tribal armies would just bring out all their soldiers and they would just hack each, at each other until one of the armies ran away. But then later it became more standardized as the Greeks developed their culture. And that fact that the Macedonians caught on to the southern Greek culture so quickly is actually, again, by around 500 BC that they caught on. The fact that they did proves that the Greeks are wrong when they say the Macedonians are barbarians and inferior to Greeks, and the fact that Philip V whooped their butt later proves it even more. But that is essentially the story of the Macedonians from the beginning to just before the time of Philip V. And Macedon, I will add, bided their time while the feuds of southern Greece were happening throughout all these other Greek city-states existing down here. They sit, sat up here with all of their abundance, and they just bided their time. And they just were able to watch over the politics of the south. A lot of southern states, they couldn't really afford this, because they were living in so condensed environments and they were living next to neighbors that were so aggressive, like the Spartans and the Athenians were living next to each other, and they were each aggressive in their own way, and they each had to watch out for each other, and they weren't the only ones. You know, Corinth was there too, defending itself. Argos, and all the states of the Peloponnese, and, and the Beatian League, let's not forget them. So, it was a big like pot of hot potatoes so to speak and they were all just jumping around and trying to secure their dominance over the south whereas Macedon was just sitting here like a sleeping bear and just waiting for the right time to wake up and strike at the rest of Greece and that strategic situation gave Macedon the time and the resources and the development it needed to secure itself to collect itself and prepare itself for the arrival of a king like Philip II who would revamp the entire Macedonian army according to the tactics he sees used in the south of Greece and officially launch the conquest of the rest of Greece and bring Macedonian supremacy to almost the entirety of the Greek Peninsula, and later it would come to the entirety of the Greek Peninsula. So, that is the introduction and the overview of Macedonian life in the beginning of the Kingdom of Macedon, from around 700 BC to just before Philip II. And that is how their economy worked and how their political situation developed and how their culture developed and military tactics developed 
and it all came together just like it did for Rome, and eventually they ended up dominating everybody else, just like Rome did on the Italian peninsula. So, it has been my pleasure to go over this period of Macedonian history with you all, and my next video will be on Philip II and his reforms and conquests of Greece, and his further expansion of the Kingdom of Macedon. And so, have an amazing time, you Philhellenes. The Ancient Greek is out.